I was in sixth grade when I received my first computer. It was a 1999 white Dell desktop computer that I knew would not fit in the tiny desk space I had living in my small New York City apartment. But man, that computer, it set the tone for years to come, and it began my love affair with technology. When the world of social media became a thing, I was one of the first people I knew to open up a Mi Gente and a BlackPlanet.com account. I connected with people all over the world, and we created these shared experiences through cyberspace. I leveraged search engines to educate myself about populations of people and places I thought were inaccessible to me living and coming from the community I was from. And then when MySpace.com came around, I taught myself how to code, simply because I wanted to have an awesome MySpace page layout. But I spent hours learning this skill. And so you would think that when my senior year in high school would come around, I would naturally want to go into a computer science, a computer engineering, or an information technology program, but I didn't. A degree or a career in technology was far from my radar. My parents moved here in the 1960s from Puerto Rico with their idea that they would grant me their American dream, that I would get a good education, become a lawyer, buy a house, get a good job, find love, and leave a legacy for what the Santana family name would mean. And if I'm being honest, no one in my family up to that point had even graduated from college or pursued a career in professional services. So if I'm even being more honest, a degree and a career in technology was probably far from everyone in my community's radar. All low-income people of color living in some of the most under-resourced neighborhoods and attending some of the most under-resourced schools. The high school I went to had outdated software programs, outdated laptops, a struggling Wi-Fi system, and a really broken computer cluster. But how could the school actually prioritize a technology or a computer science education when they felt they had more pressing issues they needed to take care of? Students at my school dropped out very often, left school, faced violence on the streets, and even at home sometimes. Many of them worked before school started, and a bunch of them worked after school and on the weekends to provide supplemental income for their families. Well, then surely the parents could mobilize and organize to make sure this was a priority for the school. Well, no. The parents in the community that I was from, they worked multiple jobs. They were just trying to survive. It was hard for them to get to parent-teacher conferences and even parent-teacher association meetings. Well, what about the administrators, the principals, the teachers? Well, no. Teachers were overworked, they were underpaid, and severely under-resourced. Administrators were just trying to figure out how they could keep math, reading, and writing standards up to par. When I entered college, my love for technology continued, even though I was majoring in accounting. But my web development skills, they became a side hustle for me. But I was finally in an environment where I realized that the technology industry and a career in this field was something that I could actually pursue. So with a job offer to one of the most prestigious accounting firms globally in my senior year, I turned it down. And I went straight into grad school and got my degree in technology and entered the field. My starting salary as a technologist coming straight out of grad school was more than four times my family's annual household income something that I didn't learn until I was an adult. 
because my family and my parents, they never told me. And even though I was no longer living in my community in Brooklyn, New York, I would still frequently visit because I still had family members there. And during these times, I thought about the information and the opportunity gaps I had growing up that delayed my career in technology in the first place. Today, technology companies are just a few blocks away from struggling schools, from overworked teachers, from communities that they surround. Technologists get off the same train stops as students do. And then they diverge in paths as they enter into their buildings, and then students go off to meet their friends before the school bell rings. Two people so close in proximity to each other, but far in projected life outcomes. This is a system that we've created, where more than often, low-income students of color are prevented from having the opportunities to create, to build, to innovate, to tinker, ultimately shutting them out of opportunities that have the ability to drastically shift economic mobility and the kind of resources they can provide themselves, their communities, and their families. In 2014, I co-founded New York on Tech with Evan Floyd Robinson, a nonprofit organization on a mission to prepare the next generation of technology leaders emerging from New York City. Our goal is to provide the development, the mentoring, the networks, and the access students need to thrive in technology and in innovation. This is a social justice issue, and our vision is that every student that graduates from our program not only obtains a career in this industry, but brings back the skills to their communities and paves the way for other students to do the same. <laughs> what would the world look like if users were creators and designers of their own problems and pr products and services? What would our world look like if we equipped people to go back to where they're from and tap into the problems that oftentimes are overlooked? And the good thing is, is that we don't need to do this alone. But before I even provide solutions, my goal today is to get you to understand that our next tech geniuses, they're sitting in our classrooms, they're working in bodegas, they're playing ball on the courts, and they're dancing on New York City trains. One way that we can help them realize their potential is to find and fund community organizations that are already doing the work. They have curriculum that you can implement. They have curriculum that you can bring into and outside of the classroom. They have industry connections. They have resources that you can use to make sure that you're creating an equitable playing field for our students to innovate. We can use our time to teach classes, have one-on-ones with students in the community who just want to learn a little bit more than what their schools are teaching them. We can host company visits and then bring them along to see what's behind the four worlds, walls of the, of the organizations that they aspire to work in. Before I leave here today, I want to share with you a quote that Mark Zuckerberg shared in his 2017 commencement speech at Harvard University. He said, if I had to worry about having, if I had to worry about taking care of my family, and not having, time to, having the time to code, if I didn't know I'd be okay if Facebook didn't work out, then I wouldn't be here where I'm standing today. This is a privilege that low-income students of color in our country currently do not have and that prevent them from creating the next innovation. We can all play a role in leveling the playing field for our children 
to innovate and to compete fairly, not for the opportunities of tomorrow, but the opportunities of today. Thank you.